I should start the talk by basically saying straight up that I'm no professional in this field. Most people will also say that they're no professional in the same field. I have no MD, I have no PhD. I'm here solely as someone who's done some work for a few years in a pretty exciting area. And I want to talk to you about a few of the things that I've come up with that has sort of touched me as something that's very interesting and as something that could take off and be something wonderful. So what I'll present here are a few assertions, and then I'll go at the end and ask you a question. And these assertions aren't fact. Few people who will say things that are all-encompassing like this are really trying to tell you fact. Those who say they are are wrong. But instead, they're to make you think. You'll agree, you'll disagree, and in reality, that's what makes great research, and that's what makes great medicine. So my first assertion is that our ability to cure or manage disease is purely by, limited by our ability to diagnose it. What that means is you can't fix what you don't know is wrong. I could drive my car down the street today and I could have a hole in my muffler, and if I'm able to drive down the street, it doesn't make a weird noise, it doesn't do anything wrong, then as far as I'm concerned, my car is fine and therefore there's no hole. But in, you know, in reality, come a few weeks down the line, the hole's gonna get big enough that I'm gonna start hearing a weird sound and pay a lot more than I would have had I gotten it fixed earlier. So therefore, my position is that if we are able to diagnose disease and diagnose disease early in its progression, we are therefore more effectively able to cure it. Okay. So what's diagnosis? And this thing should be pretty much recognizable to everyone. And in 2016, it's going to have its 200th birthday. And that's rather exciting, I think. This is a stethoscope. This is a means of diagnosis. You put it on your own heart, you say, ha, I could hear that. That's pretty cool. All right. You put it on someone else's heart, and you may get a little bit worried about what you're hearing. Because if it's not like yours, then you start wondering what you, what's going on. But that's going on, and it's still used every day, just like it had been 200 years ago. It's an ECG. Same type of idea, leads put on your heart. This is used in every type of diagnostic exam for cardiac. It is part of our ACLS protocol that states that we must know what your rhythm looks like before we can handle it. It is used pretty much in every field in internal medicine and surgery as a means of either a preoperative workup or a continuing follow-up. So pulse ox meter, every EMT in the room should know how to use this at this point. And that tells us something important because not every patient who's breathing in a way that we notice it is necessarily breathing well. And therefore it's important to know what exactly is going through their blood. And then finally are just our basic lab test tubes, a means of diagnosis and no other, no different really than a stethoscope. It's just a bit of a different way of taking it. And this is where we're going to is the age of personalized medicine. The notion that now we are going to be able to take what's been a generic form of diagnosis like the stethoscope and personalize it to your individual genetics, your individual DNA. And this is both exciting and scary to a lot of people because if we can personalize your diagnosis, personalize your management in medicine, what does that mean? I can personalize my kids. I like blue eyes. I'm gonna have blue eyes for my kids. So what are we going up to now? And it, for all of you who are giant nerds in the audience like me, I was a big Trekkie, and I love this idea. This is the Qualcomm X Prize announced in 2012. The idea that if you were able to create a Star Trek tricorder, something that could diagnose 13 different diseases in three different patients, then you were able to, then in a non-invasive fashion, then you get $10 million. And there are institutions, San Diego State, major companies, there are huge grants going around purely to try to get the money from this prize. And I think that's really exciting, and there are some people who say in the next year, we're gonna see something cool. So here's my second assertion. Now that we've talked about our first one, I've tried to make my case, I'm gonna make a second one. And that's purely within the field of surgery. Our outcomes are based upon the detection of blood flow. And not just our outcomes, but our complications. And they not just depend on blood flow, they depend most on blood flow. And so what do I mean by that? It's a pretty bold statement to make. And so if we were to look at blood flow, look at this type of patient, you know, this is a burn. This is not just a burn that you know you touch a hot stove, you get a blister for a couple of days. This is a deep, deep burn. This is another burn. It's a guy who has his face pretty badly scarred up by an injury. And this is what a burn patient can look like weeks later if not properly diagnosed and managed. Burns are notoriously difficult to manage in the emergency department. And that's mostly because of two major issues that you're faced with. First, there are a lot of burn patients and burns don't all come in the same shape and size. I could show you two burn patients with the exact same burned area, and their mode of management is phenomenally different. But also because we are not worried about management of the initial burn injury. In fact, the FDA isn't even really worried about the management of the initial burn injury. They're worried about what happens afterwards, and that's our scarring. 
we get a scar on our hand, you know, I got a bad paper cut and I got a tiny little scar. We say, okay, that's okay. This guy's face is gonna look like that forever. You're an employer, you're a parent, you're a child, you are someone walking past you in the street, you are never seen in the same way again, hired in the same way again, managed in any way in the same way because of your scar. So I'm gonna tell you about a few facts. First of all, the number one leading cause of time missed from work is burns and has been burns for since we've been alive. 450,000 burn injuries this year. 26,000 admissions to 125 burn units in the year 2011. And that's because the year, it's a bit of a delay in terms of getting data, but this number is going up. We have a burn unit on campus that does quite well as well. And finally, the admissions average of 9.7 days, 9 point over a week in a burn unit, in a hospital, a long stay is considered three days. Now we're here for over a week. And they're gonna cost $83,000, and that's just the average. Patients with, with not as bad wounds don't usually cost this much. Patients who will die because of their burn injuries cost hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of dollars to manage. So what, a, what is a burn? Okay, I'm talking about this pretty abstractly. Let's talk about what burns are. Your typical first degree burn is if you go to the beach, you have a great time at the beach and you get a little bit of a sunburn. You turn red, you can't sleep on your right shoulder at night. It ruins a vacation, but it doesn't really ruin your life. Second degree burn is your partial thickness burn. It's why the, bur it's the actual damage has gone into your dermis, below that superficial layer of skin. And that's if you've ever gotten a really bad blistering sunburn, that's your second degree burn. And then finally, a full thickness. You've burned through your entire skin. You might see bone, you might see the muscle. This is now a terrible, terrible injury. And the problem is, Partial thickness, this second degree burn, can progress to a third degree burn if you don't treat it, ma treat it rapidly enough or properly enough. And that means that something that's not all that bad, a blistering sunburn hasn't killed anyone yet, the full thickness burn is really what you worry about more. And that's why diagnosis is so important. I will make another assertion and it's, this one is grounded on basic fact. Much of the time a patient spends in a burn unit is solely related to the decision of the surgeon on whether to operate a full thickness burn, which needs grafting, versus a second degree burn, which may, not, may just require conservative therapy. So I'm not the first one to come up with the idea of using some sort of detection apparatus to diagnose burns better. And it's been identified that 66% of burn injuries are diagnosed properly. That means that one out of every three patients that works through a burn, walks through a burn unit is going to either have too much surgery or too little surgery, in both cases equal too much scarring. So Dr. Pape, about 10 years ago, came out with the use of this laser Doppler instrument. This instrument's been around for a long time. It looks at visible red light, basically reflecting off of flowing red blood cells to give you a measurement point. And they wanted to see if you could use this on burns, if it could tell you where to cut. So this is the Doppler machine, okay? It's this big bulky thing. It has a scanner up top, hooked up to a computer, gives you a nice wide image. But it's a scanner, so you gotta have your hand completely stationary underneath it while looking at it. And this is the picture that you get. Red is good perfusion, blue is bad perfusion. And you can tell that it usually highlights the poor areas or the damaged areas pretty well. Now, there are some basic drawbacks to this technology, though. And the first one I've already said, you have to keep a burn patient's hand completely stationary under a machine to get a good reading. Now, they've adapted. There are now rapid acquisition devices. And now it's really gone to depth of penetration. That's the second one. The signal for visible red light goes barely a millimeter below your skin. You think that's enough to see a burn that's going to go many, multiple millimeters down? Not really. And then finally, it's the pure bulk of having this apparatus in your, in your burn unit that makes it very difficult. There's an expense factor, there's an operation factor, there's a purely experience-based tactic, not much different than ultrasound. And that makes whatever readings you get from this machine not quantitative, and by that I mean your temperature is quantitative, but qualitative. By that I see you see red, therefore cut, you see blue, therefore don't. And that's just simply not good enough when talking about something that impacts a patient's life so much. So this is a device that I've been working in for a couple of years now, and this is certainly not the only one that exists of it. There have been dozens of different apparatuses produced like this, but this is based around the molecule endocyanin green. Endocyanin green is a fluorescent marker. It's the only one approved by the FDA. Its only approval use is for use in uh, coronary artery bypass grafting. If you com if, uh, complete a graft and you inject the dye, it lights up, and that tells you that it's a good one. But right now we're saying, well, this dye that can be injected through a basic catheter, no different than giving a patient IV fluids. Now, what else can we see with it? How deep can it go? And what's even more exciting about this is because it's a dye that's coursing through your body, we can acquire it real time with a movie apparatus instead of doing a scanning. 
and that means I could wave at you, and you'll get a reading from it. Now, I don't recommend you do that if we actually take a scan. It's, it's not great, but you know, you get the, sort of the idea of what I'm trying to get across. Okay? So what do we do to test it? Is this is a burn. This is not a burn on a human. This is a burn on a pig. And why do we use pigs in research? A lot of people will say, well, animal research is bad. And I'm not necessarily going to disagree that there's you know, research that is, uh, is painful to animals on occasion. But the reason why we use pigs is because pig skin is most similar to our own. Therefore, if a model with a pig works, then it is more likely to work on a human than if we were to use another animal model. So this is a 2.5 by 2.5 centimeter wound that's in a validated model. It says, if I have that stamp, I know exactly how deep this burn goes. And we've used both forms of imaging. We've used this endocyanin green, which is on the bottom, and we use the laser Doppler on the top. And what should be most exciting to you by this image is not just that you're looking at a bunch of red and blue squares, because I wouldn't even know what the hell I'm looking at if I actually saw that, but what's that the images look exactly the same. The pixels of the Doppler look exactly like the pixels of the ICG, except the ICG was acquired in 30 seconds. The Doppler scan took eight minutes. Now, we use a bit of an older Doppler. It has gotten a little faster, but 30 seconds is pretty good. And 30 seconds has given us spectacularly stronger data, as our group has published for quite a while now, which is very exciting with, for us. So I'm going to go to assertion number three. Because if you think about this dye going through your body, we've just talked about burns, but well, what else can we use with this? What else makes this so cool? And the answer is this is, in my mind, a game changer in medicine. Real-time perfusion analysis and real-time perfusion acquisition is a change that we have not seen before and that may, will change the way surgical diagnostics works and hopefully basic medical diagnostics in, 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 in this manner or in different ones. Okay, so what do I mean? And this is a video here. This is of a rat model, and we've actually occluded the top side. That's going to show some stasis. We basically knocked out the vascular outflow on one side and then let it go free on the other. And using this movie, we can actually measure what happens when, you, when, a vet, when a, uh, an organ loses the blood flow not into the organ. You can tell that pretty quickly in most cases, but out of the organ, which often takes hours to manifest. This is in skin. This can be with, with uh, any type of uh, a flap surgery. It's a wide application in both orthopedics and plastic surgery. And what do we find is in this video, we actually get significant difference within 30 seconds of starting this device, of saying, well, this is your inflow and outflow. And therefore, if it stays high for a long time, you're probably okay. If it starts low and then builds itself back up, there's a problem and you need to operate. This has been a problem. This has been something that, you know, uh, mentors of mine over at Stony Brook would be out of the OR driving back home and then need to get called back in because hours after their surgery, something would look like it was going wrong in a surgery. So this is another one. This is a piece of skin that we've isolated from blood flow in a rat. This big rectangle is only getting blood flow from the area that has red in the base. And the blue is showing where the blood flow isn't going. And what we do with this is it's actually a standardized model, not just to analyze how skin dies and whether we can measure how skin dies, but it's also meant to test different pharmaceuticals in order to see whether we can salvage skin better. And this applies mostly to patients that we've looked at with breast cancer who need breast reconstructions. This type of compromise of skin during the breast reconstruction can occur up to 40% of patients. And that is a humongous stress to a patient that's already had cancer. And that's very difficult to tell them, well, there's a little bit of you know, dying skin, we have to cut again. And sure enough, we can measure not just with laser Doppler on your right, but with the spy machine and with the clinical analysis. So you should ask yourself now, what can, we, what can we really do going forward with this? What other things can we do? Because I've just talked about skin for the most part. And the answer is, there are multiple papers that show you can track sentinel lymph nodes without radioactive tracer. You don't need to use a radioactive dye anymore in order to find the sentinel lymph node in a breast cancer patient. And I should describe what that is. When you have a breast cancer patient, you need to know whether the cancer is spreading. Now, to cut all of the nodes out of your, uh, out of your, out of your axilla, which is where your, your lymph nodes are, it's where the cancer is most likely to spread, what happens is the arm of the patient on that side will blow up because there's no outflow of, of lymph, which is basically the fluid that bathes our body. Okay, so by you doing this, we only cut the very first lymph node that comes, that comes out of the breast. And by cutting that one, if there's no cancer in it, we have very good data to show that we don't need to do it anymore. This is widely done not just for breast cancer, but for melanoma, gastric cancer, testicular cancer. Multiple forms are being managed in this manner. And they're all being used with technetium-99 dye, which is a radioactive tracer and a Geiger counter. It's pretty crude management, but we've gotten really good at it. But if we can use it non-radioactively, surely that's a better solution. 
we can do wound modeling. We can no longer look straight at something and say, well, that looks bad, because I can do that a lot. I mean, I can walk through a burn unit and look at someone's face and say, well, that looks bad. But now we can model it and we can say quantitatively exactly what's wrong, what we cut, how we cut. Finally, we're gonna look at skin survival. We're gonna look at skin survival within minutes of surgery just in the same manner as we looked at, but not just in the breast flaps from a reconstructive patient, but with patients with large scale wounds that need reconstruction, abdominal reconstructions, any type of soft tissue compromise from fractures. And then finally, we believe that this is a way to test and validate the use of new and novel pharmaceuticals against cancer and disease. Because what we've found and what others have published is that you can bind antibodies to this dye, and therefore I can make your tumor light up, and I can make nothing but your tumor light up. So I have a final assertion, which is that we've only just begun. We've talked about a lot of concepts, we've talked about a lot of applications for this new device, for this new fluorescent dye, and this dye has really been around for quite a while. This is just new ways of using it. And I do believe that whether it be through this methodology or through others, we are about to enter a new diagnostic golden age. And from that diagnostic golden age, we will then enter a management golden age. Because of my assertion, my first one is correct. One must happen before the other. So we've talked about these applications already, and then we're gonna keep on moving forward. Ultimately, what's our goal? Better health, longer life, happier life. Thank you. Thank you.